Well, thank you, Peter uh, and Patricia, for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to try to stay on time. This is the title that I use when I uh, give this talk around the country and around the world because it basically angers people and they come to the lecture when they see the uh, title. I'm going to make three bold assertions here. Uh, the first is that in expert hands and high quality institutions and in the overwhelming majority of cases, there is no evidence that technique plays any role in an astomotic leak. Um, good technique is critical. Nobody's arguing that the battle uh, can be won or lost in the operating room. But while a breach in technique certainly can cause a leak, nobody's arguing that bad technique is, is unforgivable. Most of the time, leaks are not due to bad technique. Patient-related factors do not account for the majority of patients that leak because most of such patients, smokers, chemo, RT, hypotension, they don't leak. Just as we heard as the previous speaker, even when the anastomosis looks horrible 25% of the time, it increases the probability of leak, but 75% of the patients that had a horrible looking anastomosis didn't leak. Why? I call this the within group fallacy, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So I want to convince you that microbes play a key and causative, causative role in an astomotic leak. Um, and this hypothesis is 60 years old. Isidore Cohen, who's an iconic figure in American surgery, uh, he recently died at the age of 94. I spoke with him on the phone a couple years ago when I started doing this work. Uh, wrote this paper in 1955, uh, two years after I was born. Uh, they took dogs, did a um, colon anastomosis in the mid-transverse colon. They devascularized a segment, and then they infused tetracycline, which is what they had, into the uh, intestine every day for three days as a formula uh, solution or saline. Both groups of dogs got penicillin because that's what they had. Their microbiota didn't change very much. This is what it looked like when they left the operating room. Nobody would leave the operating room with that. You don't need infrared technology to, to be able to say that's a bad thing. As you can imagine, uh, later uh, at seven days, uh, five to six uh, leaked uh, dogs developed peritonitis. But there were no leaks in the group that got tetracycline. The only way to explain that is to say that microbes must play a primary causative role in leak because even when technique is grossly inadequate, modulation of those contents prevents leak. Here's another study done from uh, Harry Levine's group in New York. And they did a mid-transverse colon anastomosis in the dog. They did not make it ischemic. But um, several days later, at about day seven, they um, opened all the animals up and put it on a strain gauge and pulled on it to test its tensile strength, assuming that the more collagen, the stronger it was, uh, the higher the tensile strength was. And in the first group that got oral erythroencanamycin for one day, you had a 20% increase in the strength over controls. Give the canamycin for three days, you have a 50% increase. Give it for six days, you almost have doubled your tensile strength. What's up with that? What's doing that? Th those, those antibiotics have no effect on collagen synthesis. Nothing further was done there. Of course, many of you are familiar with this study, which was sort of the uh, preeminent study of asking us to use oral antibiotics to reduce septic complications. And this study was a double-blind, a randomized crossover design of oral antibiotics, and there are famous names up there. Uh, Ron Nichols, uh, Bob Condon, uh, James Clark, Dr. Bartlett, and others. But this study showed a significant reduction in anastomotic leaks in the oral antibiotic group. But they qualified in the discussion in this paper. They say, well, you know, we all know that leaks are from technique, so we better throw those out and redo the data because we don't want to tell people oral antibiotics reduce anastomotic leak. That's ridiculous. Here's the next study done, 1984, and it's done in rats drinking antibiotics or getting them IV, devascularized. Ooh, that's bad. They're all going to leak. And you can see here you had an enteral group of neomycin and uh, erythro, no antibiotics or parenteral of clindamycin. And you can see very quickly 
that no antibiotics, you had a high leak rate. If you gave enteral antibiotics, you had no leak. And if you gave parenteral antibiotics, you had a 50% leak. Is that technique? What are they doing? So we irrationally eliminated oral antibiotics. When I first sort of got into practice, as we saw, everything started getting better despite all those great reports starting in 1917 all the way to, to that report that I just showed you. But then outcomes got better. Second generations, just cephalosporins came into view. And you know we decided we don't need no stinking oral antibiotics, and we eliminated them. But the leak rates remain steady, anywhere from 5 to 10 percent, depending on how you define it. And remember now, we define leaks only when patients come back and complain something's wrong. Uh, there's probably a lot of our patients that have subclinical leaks that we don't know about. Certainly we didn't know that. So now the luminaries have redone these studies, and they're publishing them in, in Annals of Surgery. They're presenting at the American Surgical, and they're telling us that oral antibiotics in 2015 actually decreased in asthmatic leak rates. No mechanism. They don't know why. They don't know which bacteria. And this is a problem in all of surgical research. We love to compare within, uh, between groups, just like the laparoscopy study, but we don't like to compare within groups. It makes us nervous. So here you can see the anastomotic leak rate. What caused this dis decrease of leak? One group got oral antibiotics, the other group didn't. Well, of course it was the antibiotics. What, are you dumb? Okay, why did these 49 patients leak? Okay, and this is what happens. This is how we respond to this. I don't always answer difficult questions like this, but when I do, I prefer a lot of hand-waving, use of metaphors, and blaming nurses and anesthesia. Okay? Within group differences, you need to account for them. So, these 49 patients that leak, they want to know the following. Did you give me the right antibiotic? Did you check which bacteria were on my anastomosis when you operated? And, and by the way, do you even know which bacteria caused leaks and how they do it? I mean, after all, it's 60 years later. So I'm going to tell you today, we don't know why oral antibiotics work on some patients and not on others, and we have no plans to find out. This is what we're doing, purgative cleansing, oral antibiotics based on 50-year-old inadequate culture data, and give IV antibiotics on the same. So I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes how bacteria, I think, cause an asthmatic leak. But first I need to educate you a little bit about how bacteria are very intelligent organisms and that they behave in social groups. Bacteria constantly gather and process information about the health status of their host and they respond accordingly. They can activate their virulence in response to these what I call host cues by bacterial telesensing and then they talk to each other through a system called quorum sensing. This is the bacterial internet. So how do they cause an asthmatic leak? Well, they're there all the time. So I mean, you can't just say it's who's there or what species is there, but what phenotype are they expressing in vivo? So you have a large tumor, a difficult dissection, okay? And you release these host compensatory cues, and that's why laparoscopy and robotic surgery is good. It reduces that trauma, okay? But then at some point, if you have the wrong bacteria there, you get information processing. That bacteria shifts its phenotype. It increases its adherence capacity. It makes collagenase. And then you create this perfect drilled out hole. You look at it. You're patting each other on the back. You're drinking beer afterwards. It's wonderful. But what you don't realize is that a little pustule, a zit, is forming on that on day two, three, four, five, and you get what I call a breakdown of collagen one and four, and that beautiful anastomosis with perfect perfusion. But if you look at the perfusion studies, the anastomotic ring, it never perfuses. It's white. It's actually not perfused. And where are the leaks? The leaks are right in the anastomosis. So what's driving that? and it's a bacterial-mediated leak. You need collagen 1 and 4. They're very important. And here's how we did this. I'm going to run through these studies very quickly. We created an animal model in which we gave pre-op pelvic irradiation. This was done by Andrea Olivas in my laboratory. 
we did a colon resection and an anastomosis, and then we inoculated the bowel with pseudomonas. When you radiate the bowel, you kill most of the bacteria in it, and pseudomonas is the most common organism to proliferate. We did all the control groups properly here, with and without bacteria, with and without radiation. And all the animals were sacrificed on day six. And when you do a good, when you have no radiation and no uh, pseudomonas, the thing heals perfectly. You can see it on the left side. And on the right side, uh, this is in rats. You can see exactly what you see in humans. Everything bunched up there, stuck. You have to pull it off, then you see a hole. And if you inject methylene blue, you'll see the hole. Only the group that got all the treatment leaked. And you can see there's a little ulcer there on there. It's not due to technique because none of the other groups leaked and they had the same technique. And this is what happens. These bacteria, they find the anastomosis, they get in vivo cued, and they express high collagenase producing phenotypes. We proved this in vitro by growing epithelial cells in culture and putting strains of pseudomonas that turn green when their virulence genes are turned on. There are not more bacteria in the bottom. There are just more bacteria whose virulence are activated. We measured their ability to break down uh, collagenase, uh, break down collagen one and four, the two most important collagens in anastomotic healing. And you can see that um, only pseudomonas from the leaking anastomosis expressed the high collagenase phenotype. So we wrote this paper recently, <clears throat> and this paper is the most molecularly detailed report on anastomotic leak uh, to date. And we felt that we had to do this because we had to grind down on the, on the mechanistic molecular uh, details and pathogenesis to really prove this point. And we had to do it with a commensal organism, not an organism that we introduced. And we found E. fecalis, and E. fecalis is very interesting. We found it because we just did anastomoses in rats and looked. And remember, you open the bowel, you let air in it. Most of the anaerobes are obligate anaerobes that are going to die, and you're going to have a bloom in bacteria like Enterococcus. And it's very hard to kill. It doesn't die even with the oral prep and the IV prep. So we did this model, same model as you saw before, took mice, devascularized, did the anastomosis. And you see, if you devascularize, you have a higher leak rate. And this is where you go, see Alverdi, it's ischemia. Are you stupid? What's wrong with you? Look, why didn't these rats leak? Now comes the hand waving. Well, it's multifactorial, it's complicated, it's, you know. And when we looked at ischemia, we did laser, uh, laser confocal laser endomicroscopy, injecting a fluorophor, uh, and you, there is no ischemia. In fact, in the devascularized group, we've been counting the blood vessels now. There are more blood vessels in the devascularized group because of neogen uh, vascular neogenesis, and uh, VEGF goes way up. But what we did find is that there was more bacterial collagenase on the anastomosis within the group. We did within the group, and the ones that healed, the 50% that healed, there was none, and the 50% that leaked, there was a lot we could see that that correlated with the amount of collagen in there, and it was differentiated between those that healed and those that leaked. More blood vessels. I have become an expert on looking at rat and mice anastomoses. And I can tell you what we see, we, we can occasionally see gross peritonitis, but what we see is exactly what you see in humans. Everything's bunched up against there. It's, it's very, I think any experienced colorectal surgeon would agree a lot of patients leak, but the body kind of seals it alone in there. So here is a picture of E. fecalis, and you can see, I don't know why that came out so funny, but E. fecalis had two phenotypes that we found. Strains that made a lot of collagenase, strains that made hardly any, and that E. fecalis correlated with who leaked and who didn't. So we took those strains, and we injected them into the rectum of uh, rats, and we could see that only the E1, the E2 caused the leak, not the uh, E2 strain. So it tells us that these high collagenase producing DPK strains alone are sufficient to cause leak. And it does this through the production of collagenase because when we knock that gene out in the E. fecalis, you can't get a leak. So this is the most important slide 
the dogma is you get ischemia, you get necrosis, bacteria leak out. The science is there's an in vivo bacterial phenotype shift. You get ischemia, necrosis, and leaks. And we showed that very nicely by looking at HIF1-alpha. It's the most sensitive indicator of tissue ischemia or hypoxia. If you devascularize alone a segment of, of sigmoid, you get a little HIF. If you do an anastomosis alone, you get more HIF. No ischemia, no devascularization. If you do the two together, you get a lot. And here's what's interesting. If you give a antibiotic transrectally, it all goes away. You have nothing there. If you eliminate bacteria, you eliminate it in this model. We had a bad leak at the University of Chicago several months ago. We found the pathogen. We injected it into mice. And it actually caused ischemia. No devascularization. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? Here's what we recommend. Give cefoxidate alone by skip. And you can see, at least in our rat model, if you give cefoxidate alone, you have a bloom in E. fecalis and a higher leak rate. If you give transrectal enema of antibiotics alone, you get no leaks. We did this in patients where we swabbed the specimens uh, after they were taken out and we only found two strains that made high collagenase, Pseudomonas and E. fecalis. And I'm going to have to skip this in the interest of time, but the one patient that leaked was the patient that had the highest collagenase activity, broke down the most MMP9, and had the most disturbed microbiome. So which antibiotics should be given? What route should be used? How long should they be given? We don't know. We've got to put the antimicrobials right where they want them. There are many ways to do this. Um, but first, we must do our homework. What if we put little donuts and cushions and blew up a gel of antibiotics in there? This is empiricism. The empiricism has to stop. The science needs to progress. So we're doing this trial. This is my last slide. Just, I'm 12 seconds overdue here. But, um, we need to know which pathogens are present at the anastomosis when we operate. But more importantly, we need to know them during recovery because we're pretty good. We stun that microbiome with the oral and IV antibiotics, but it's what happens in the next three to 30 days as that uh, anastomosis gets colonized that's important. So we need to look, learn, and discover, and this will inform the design path forward. Thank you very much.